Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you guys today is one that happened all the way over in Denmark. So a lot of articles that I found for this case were either in Dutch, Swedish, or Norwegian. So I relied on Google Translate for a lot of this information. There were also a lot of podcasts that I found that had interviews with Emily's friends and family, but that too was in Dutch. So unfortunately I could not listen to them. So I did my absolute best to find any information that I possibly could for this video. Of course, there's always the possibility of things being translated a little bit funky, so keep that in mind as well. I did my absolute best to interpret everything that I could. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Native. At this point, if you've watched my channel for a while, you know that I love Native and their products, with one of my favorite of their products being their amazing body washes. When I look for a body wash, I look for something that has simple, clean ingredients that will leave me feeling clean with a nice, fresh scent that isn't overpowering, and I love Native for those exact reasons. Native gives you a luxurious, foamy lather without using sulfates that other companies use Use to make their body washes foamy. They are sulfate-free, folate-free, and dye-free, and anybody can use it. It's made with plant-based purified gentle ingredients like citric acid for pH balance and food-grade cleansing salts to keep your skin fresh and clean. I love that their body washes keep my skin feeling fresh and clean without leaving any residue, keeping my skin fresh and smooth. The other thing that I love about Native is their wide variety of scent choices. They literally have so many different scents that just when you think you've tried them all, they're coming out with another new one all the time. So first, I have the Lavender and Rose scent. You guys already know that I'm obsessed with this scent in Native's deodorant, so of course I had to get the body watch to match. It's such a nice floral scent without being too sweet or too strong. Then I have Lilac and White Tea, which is another amazing scent. This one is more subtle and fresh with having that floral smell that I love. Then I have Rosé. I've been using this one the longest. I buy it every time I run out of body wash because it just leaves me with such a nice, sweet, and fresh scent. Native also has so much more to offer beyond their amazing body washes. I also love their deodorants as well as their toothpaste. I literally use them every single day. Now, three native body washes normally go for $27. But if you use my link down below and use code RACHELSHANNON10, you can get three of them for only $17. That is 40% off. That's such a great deal, but this is a limited time offer. So if I were you, I would stock up as soon as I can. Again, that is RACHELSHANNON10 for 40% off of your three native body washes. Thank you again so much to Native for sponsoring today's video. So with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the murder of Emily Mang. Emily Mang was born on July 31st, 1998 in Kisor, Denmark to her parents, Nicholas Govgaard and Helen Mang. When she was six years old, her parents did end up getting divorced, so she lived with her mother and her stepdad. I read in one article that her and her dad didn't have the best relationship growing up, but it seemed that she was still very loved by her father. Other than that, I haven't been able to find a ton about her life growing up, but it seemed to be relatively normal. Now, you all know that I really like to find out information about each victim and what their hobbies are and their goals and aspirations are in life, but from what I can gather, she seemed like such an outgoing and fun-loving young girl. It was obvious to me that her friends, family, and community all loved her very much, and they're all very upset with how this case happened. Now, on July 10th, 2016, Emily and three of her friends went to the nearby town of Slakes with one of these friends being her best friend, Nicole Gruntoft. They had spent their time shopping at different stores, they went to a hookah bar, and eventually they decided to stop at McDonald's. After that, at around 3 a.m., the girls boarded a train and started the nine-minute ride back to Kassar. Now, the friends would describe the mood that evening as very fun and exciting. However, at some point in the night, Emily's friends noticed a sudden shift in her behavior. They could all tell that something was bothering her and she was 
acting a bit off. Her friend Nicole particularly noticed this sullen mood on the train ride home. As it turns out, as the friends were going about their night, Emily had received a text from the boy that she had been seeing, which put her in a really bad mood. According to Nicole, this boy had texted Emily that they were never really dating, that they were never exclusive, and that he wanted to stop talking to her. So obviously, this was upsetting for Emily, and this seems to be what dampened her mood for the rest of the night. So at around 3.50 a.m., the train arrived at the Kasor train station, and the three friends exited the train together. They had all been talking about getting a taxi to drive them back home, and they were all going to split the cost. However, as they were all waiting for the taxi, Emily was adamant that she was not going to be taking the taxi. Instead, she wanted to walk home alone. She explained that her house was just down the road on a gravel path and that she would be just fine. Of course, her friends protested this and they begged her to take the taxi with them, but she just would not budge. Now, Kassar is a relatively small town of 14,600 people that is known to be a bit of a tourist area, but more importantly, it's known to be a safe area. Nicole would go on to say that even though they didn't love the idea of Emily walking home alone, they really didn't think that anything would happen because nothing happens in Kassar. I also want to note now that there's no reason to believe that any of these girls were on drugs or took any other substances like alcohol, so there's not really any reason to believe that Emily was intoxicated in any way. It just seemed like she was really upset about this guy that she was talking to, dumping her, and she just wanted some time alone to blow off steam. So by 4 a.m., the three girls got into the taxi, they hugged Emily and told her goodbye, and they told her to text them when she gets home safely. As the taxi drove drove away, the friends watched as Emily walked down the gravel path in the direction of her home. The walk was going to be around two kilometers for her, and as she was walking, she continued texting her friends from her cell phone until the battery ultimately died or it was shut off. I will note that while they were on the train, Emily was trying to charge her phone the entire time, but obviously nine minutes isn't enough time to really get a good charge, so it's assumed that her phone had died. However, that next morning, or or I guess the same morning, Emily's mother went into her bedroom to check on her only to find that her bedroom was empty. Now, this didn't immediately concern Helen because she knew that Emily had gone out with friends. She assumed that it was possible that Emily had just stayed the night at one of her friend's houses and just forgot to tell her. But by 9 a.m. that morning, when Emily did not arrive to her church to sing in the choir like she did every single Sunday, those at church were concerned. It just was not like Emily to show up late, or especially it wasn't like her to skip choir altogether. So Helen called the church to make sure that she showed up for choir, but that is when Helen was told that she had not shown up. They also tried calling her cell phone multiple times that morning, but as we know, her phone was off. So immediately, Helen reported Emily as a missing person to the police. That same day, Emily's parents went to the media to start to spread awareness about their daughter's disappearance. By that next day, Monday, July 11th, 2016, police started searching for Emily and over 200 volunteers from the community came out to help. They had utilized a helicopter, sniffer dogs, and a dive team all to search for Emily. However, it had been raining pretty hard that day, so the helicopter had to stop searching, and ultimately, the rain got so bad that pretty much all of the volunteers had to call off the searches. People continued searching for her in the following days, with Emily's family repeatedly appealing to the public for help in finding their missing daughter. However, at first, the police did treat Emily's disappearance as a runaway, and there was a couple reasons for this, I guess. So there was one time in her past where she had run away to Copenhagen and she was actually there for multiple weeks before she came back. Then, of course, Emily's friends told police about the messages between her and this guy that she was seeing. So they thought that maybe this was the reason that she ran away and they were expecting her to show back up very soon. There is something else that happened in this case that was a bit strange. 
So, of course, after Emily went missing, her friends were frantically texting and calling her to see if she would pick up. However, as we know, her phone had either been turned off or it died, and her friends kind of knew that it probably had died because, again, she was charging her phone on the train that night. However, there were people who were sending her Facebook messages, and Facebook was actually showing that Emily was opening and reading these messages. So, this gave a lot of people some hope that maybe she was still alive and just wasn't responding to anybody but for some reason police did not think this was the case they seemed very adamant that it probably was not her who was opening and reading these messages now i don't know why they said this we still don't really know why it's still up in the air i don't know what police were thinking with this or why they said that and we still don't know because police never told us. As days passed, these searches continued. They searched different bodies of water. They continued to deploy helicopters and they had numerous volunteers, but they continued to find absolutely nothing. So they thought at this time that maybe Emily had gone with someone willingly and they took her away to another town because they found zero trace of Emily anywhere in this town. Months passed and still no sign of Emily. There were a few witnesses who came forward to police to say that they had seen Emily, but none of these sightings had panned out. In addition to this, one searcher came out on July 27th with a torn black sweater that was found at the Kassar station and it looked similar to the one that Emily was wearing when she went missing. But they said that the sweater did not belong to Emily. Then on August 7th, another black sweater was found in the searches and they handed it over to police. However, police did not comment on whether this belonged to Emily or not. They didn't say it did and they didn't say it didn't. So again, we just don't know. Months continued to pass until October 14th, 2016, when police arrested a suspect for Emily's disappearance and murder. The police ended up arresting a 33-year-old truck driver who they accused of murdering Emily. He was in part arrested because he did have a prior history of sexual assault against a minor. Police took him in and questioned him and then searched around his home and his yard to see if they could find anything connecting him to Emily. They had dug up several sites around his property to see if he had buried anything there. However, after checking his truck's GPS data, it showed that he was not in the area of Kasor on the night of Emily's disappearance. The suspect would later come out to say that he's frustrated and upset about being looked into for this. He said, quote, I'm sick of it. It's hurting my family and I'm a little tired of it. And the reason I want to tell the public about it is that of course the police have to take the report seriously, but I think they made too big of a deal out of it. They should put two and two together and check my alibi before they come out with 16 men to search my home. However, by 2018, this same man was arrested again, this time for raping a nine-year-old girl. So I honestly don't feel bad for him whatsoever, and I hope he's rotting in prison. Then there was a 67-year-old man who police received tips about saying that he had kidnapped Emily and he was holding her captive. Neighbors came forward to police to say that they had heard screaming and knocking coming from this man's home in the weeks after Emily's disappearance. So police did end up following these tips and they actually searched his home on five separate occasions. One of these times, they brought in equipment and they started to drill holes in the ground as well as into the plinth of his home, but they didn't find anything connecting this man to Emily in any of their searches. This man came out to say that he had actually spoken with his lawyer because he believes that his phones had been bugged and police had been listening in on his conversations. He said that he believed this was illegal because they had no reason to bug his house because they had no evidence to prove that he was involved in anything relating to Emily. He said, quote, I've been harassed so much that they must have an ugly taste in their mouth. He said that after they searched and damaged his home, he was left to clean up the mess. Police have said that due to all of the media in this case, they now believe that people are calling in reports saying that they saw or heard something suspicious when it could be something completely innocuous. For obvious reasons, these men's names aren't really listed in a lot of reports. I did find them in a couple of articles, but for the sake of this case and their involvement in this specific case, 
I won't mention their names. Police had also been working to analyze cell phone traffic around the area, and they found over 200 phone numbers that they called interesting. However, it was later reported that there was a data loss incident where all of the numbers that they had obtained had all been erased. So people were outraged that police may have had their hands on Emily's murderer's phone number, but they just lost it. However, by 2019, police said that they were able to get all of the data back, but still, I don't really think anything came of this as far as I've been able to see. As time continued to pass without any new leads or any new information, the public was becoming scared and agitated and frustrated. Emily's case was growing cold and it was starting to seem that police were just not getting anywhere. However, Emily's friends and family's worst fears were confirmed when a body was found at around 4 p.m. on December 24th, so Christmas Eve, in 2016. There had been a man who was walking his dog in the forested area near the Renamarks Baki Lake near Borup when he thought that he had seen something in the lake. He walked closer and he soon realized that what he had spotted was a body. Of course, he called the police to report what he had found and it was confirmed the next day, so Christmas Day, that this body did belong to 17-year-old Emily Mang. Now, the area that Emily's body was found was actually 37 miles away from where she was last seen at the Kasor train station. So people were wondering, how did she get there? Was she killed after she was kidnapped and then someone drove her all the way down there and then dumped her? Was she kidnapped in the area and then held in this new area before she was murdered there and then dumped there? Police said though that based on the level of decomposition of her body, they believed that she had been dumped shortly after her disappearance and that she had been in that water ever since. Like I said before, this truly is supposed to be a safe area. People of Kassar were shook and the people who knew Emily, including her family, friends, and classmates, they were all devastated. By January 19th, 2017, they held a candlelight vigil for her at the St. Paul's Church where Emily used to sing in the choir. People around Kassar started to get worried about their own safety. Parents started picking up their children from school and taking them directly home, or they would give their children money for taxis to make sure that they would never have to walk home alone. Then there was a local vigilante group who called themselves the Night Ravens, who started riding their bike around the train stations in the area. They focused especially on any area where young men liked to congregate and approach young women. At one point, this group was surveilling that 67-year-old man that we discussed earlier because they thought that he had kidnapped Emily and was holding her captive. However, the police said that they understand the anguish that people in this community must be feeling, but they said that the Night Ravens have gone too far with their surveilling, so they need to hand over the entire investigation to the police. The police said, quote, we recommend that we be left in charge of the investigation of the missing Emily. Mang. This is what we are set in the world for, and we have both the tools and the training for it. Therefore, we want to appeal to you to think really hard before you start running with loose rumors. It hurts both the investigation and Emily's family. We are still working intensively to find out what may have happened on July 10th, and we still have more directions that we can move our investigation in. After this, the Night Ravens did agree to step down and hand over the entire investigation to the police. So so the police did continue to search for Emily's killer, but again, they just were not releasing anything. Six more months passed without any information until June of 2017. Now, police had been receiving tips throughout the entire investigation, but they had never really come forward to the public to tell them about these tips. But as time passed without any answers in the case, they started releasing what these tips were. There had been two witnesses who were out jogging on the early morning hours of July 10th, 2016. 
they claimed to witness a white van speeding through Kisor Lyskov on the narrow asphalt road that Emily was known to have been walking on. The runners actually said that this person was driving so erratically that they had to jump off of the side of the road to avoid being hit by them. Then another witness came forward to say that they also saw a white van that looked suspicious in Lyskov in Kisar at around 4 a.m also on the morning of Emily's disappearance. This witness had been out for a morning walk when he saw the white van around six kilometers away from the Kassar station, and they described this car as being a Mercedes Sprinter. The witness said that this van had been driving insanely fast with the headlights off and had driven back and forth on the same road about four times. He said that this was suspicious because why in the world would someone be driving like that so early in the morning? In July of 2017, police publicly released the information about these cars. They said that they believed the car to be a white Hyundai i30. Another witness then came forward to say that at around 10 p.m. on July 10th, so around 20 hours after Emily was last seen, she also saw a white van near the Renny Marks Baki Lake. The witness described the situation saying that she couldn't see anybody in the car, but it was clear that somebody was in there. She said that the car was moving in a way that the person inside was doing something that belonged in the bedroom and not on a remote country road. She said that she was actually on this road because she had been dropping a colleague off at work in the area. Then after dropping the colleague off, she drove back on the same road and she saw that the van was still parked there. However, she said at this time, the car was no longer moving. She tried driving past it closer this time to see if anybody was inside, but once again, she didn't see anybody. When she found out about Emily's body being found in this lake, she checked her schedule to make sure that it was on the same day, July 10th, that she saw this situation, and it was. So she went to police to report what she had seen, but once again, it kind of seemed like police just brushed her off. To this day, this witness had come forward to say that she is terrified that what she saw on that day was Emily's body being dumped. Now, police were confident that the car that all of these witnesses came forward saying that they saw was a white Hyundai i30 because it had actually been captured on surveillance video. It was seen driving from the parking lot at the Kassar station the same night that Emily was last seen there. Police weren't initially able to release this information because they said that the quality of the images were so poor that they couldn't make anything out initially. But they sent the video off to a foreign lab who were able to enhance the images enough so that they could see the make and the model of this car. Then, another two witnesses came forward to talk about how they heard screams as well as a male voice on the night that Emily went missing. So, the first witness is a young woman living in Kisor with her mother, and they live near that dirt path that Emily was known to have been walking on on the night that she was last seen. This woman said that on the early morning hours of July 10th, 2016, she was awakened by what she described as a loud, shrill cry emitted by the full force of the lungs. She said that immediately after the scream, she heard a male voice, but she could not make out what the male was saying. She said that once she found out about a girl going missing from the same area, she went straight to the police, but she said once again that police just did not seem interested in what she had to say, and once again, she thinks that she was sort of just brushed off by them. Then there's another witness who said that he heard screams that same morning. This witness is a man who is said to have a developmental disability and he's living in community housing. He said that he heard the very loud sound of a girl screaming on the morning of July 10th, but once again, it seems like police did not take him seriously. Now, I don't know why it was even mentioned that this man had a disability in the article that I read, but it was, so I don't know if they're hinting that police maybe didn't take him seriously because of his disability or if they just thought that it was important. I'm not really sure why. 
hasn't really been stated why, but once again, police just don't seem to be taking any of these witnesses seriously. Then it came out that in 2019, police had started collecting DNA from multiple people in Emily's own neighborhood. They ended up gathering over 1,100 DNA samples from these individuals. So people started to wonder why police were looking into people who were in Emily's neighborhood if she was found so far away from where she was taken. Then also in 2019, another man was arrested in connection to Emily's disappearance. This was a 42-year-old man who did own a white Hyundai. He had already been in prison in connection with two other murders that he had confessed to. One murder was a 68-year-old man named Kian Anderson, which took place in April, and the other was the murder of an 80-year-old man named Powell Frank, which took place in June. This man stabbed both of the victims in their homes and then burned down their homes afterwards to cover up his tracks. However, as you can tell, these murders are distinctly different from Emily's. They were both elderly men, while Emily is a 17-year-old girl. He stabbed both men in their homes and then burned them down while Emily was abducted and dumped in the lake, so he was ultimately found as having no connection to Emily. So up to this point, that's pretty much all of the information that I could find on this case. We have a bit of a timeline and multiple witnesses, but I couldn't find anywhere what her cause of death is, if it's unknown, or if it just hadn't been released. Now, with this case, police have been scrutinized for what the public and Emily's family sees as a botched investigation. They don't think that police put forth their best efforts in finding Emily, and even when they did, they didn't even really know what they were doing. Emily's family says that they spent way too much time during the initial weeks of the investigation just labeling Emily Emily as a runaway. They said that they missed out on a valuable time that could have been used looking to find the person who is responsible rather than just assuming that she left on her own accord. Then it came out that police failed to interview any witnesses during the initial days of the investigation. There had actually been a man present at the Kassar station that Emily went missing from on the night of her disappearance. He was actually never contacted by police to do an interview, so he had to come forward himself in July of 2019, so three years after Emily's disappearance. He said that he actually tried coming forward to police multiple times before that, but the police were ignoring him. They were just never getting back to him, so he actually had to go out to the news media to tell them what was going on and to tell them that police would not question him in order to get their attention. Then the taxi driver who picked up Emily's friends that night, he wasn't questioned until three months after her disappearance. So literal people who were present at the scene that Emily went missing from on the same time that she was there, they were not questioned right away. For the taxi driver, it was three months later. For this other witness, it was three years later. So of course, by then, their memories are not going to be nearly as solid as they would have been if they were questioned within hours of this happening. It also came out that there was surveillance video near the lake where Emily's body was found, but police never looked into it. So if someone was captured dumping Emily's body there, they wouldn't have seen it. Or some might say that her body was found so late after being dumped there that the footage would have been erased by then anyways, so there was no point in examining it. That could be true, but what if the killer went back to that area multiple times to see if her body was still there? Maybe they went there multiple times because, you know, killers like to revisit the scene where they dumped a body that could have been found on the surveillance video, or they could have just looked around the area. Maybe this person lives or works in the area, so they could have used surveillance video to see if they could have captured that suspicious car going to the area multiple times, but they never looked at the surveillance video. So if there was something important on it, we will never know. Then we have all of those witnesses who came forward to say that they felt that they were brushed off and not taken seriously by the police. Was it because the police didn't care or was it because they didn't know how to handle an investigation? 
or was it both? I will say that maybe the police did take the witnesses' statements seriously, but they just didn't want to say anything because they didn't want to give out too much information. So even though they took down their statements, they just told them to leave. Who knows? But with all of these witnesses coming forward to say that they felt brushed off, that's a pattern. If it was one person who said that the police didn't take them seriously, then, you know, that could be a different thing. Maybe that person just read them the wrong way. But all of these people coming out to say that police did not take them seriously, that definitely is not a good sign. But because of how badly this investigation was handled, we are left with no answers in who murdered Emily Mang. I do think that police did try to figure out what happened to her. I think that they put forward efforts into looking for her, but clearly, as we saw, they arrested so many different people who didn't have anything to do with it. They searched someone's home thoroughly before they could have just checked the GPS data on their car to see if they were even in the area. If they would have just done that first, they wouldn't have wasted so many hours and manpower to look through this man's house. Why did they search through that man's house five different times if they continue not to find anything? It just seems like police were wasting a lot of resources. They clearly didn't really know what they were doing, even if they were trying, even if they were putting forward their best efforts, they clearly didn't know what they were doing and they should have asked for some outside help. I don't know how it works in Denmark. I know that in the US, if there's local police that just aren't you know figuring anything out if they just don't think the investigation is going well they can always ask for the help of the fbi so the federal investigators i'm sure there's some in denmark or in europe in general they could have asked for outside help but it doesn't seem like they did so there are a few theories as to what exactly happened to emily she could have either been stalked by someone who followed her to the area and took her or what I think is most likely is that she might have just been the victim of a random attack. Now, Emily had been out with her friends that entire day, going around to different places, not really having a predictable pattern before they returned back to the train station at around 4 a.m. Really, there's no way that anybody could have known that she would be at that location at that time. Now, I don't know if police ever found her phone, so I don't think they were able to look at her cell phone records. So it is possible that she secretly texted someone to meet her at the train station, and that's why she said that she wanted to walk home, when in reality, she was getting picked up by somebody and just didn't want her friends to know about it. And then this person met up with her and then they did something to her. Obviously, we have to wonder what the deal is with this guy that just broke up with her right before she went missing. I hope he was questioned, but with how badly this investigation seemed to go down, I don't know if he was or not. I haven't seen anything about him other than the fact that he texted her that night. So, I hope they at least looked into him and looked into what kind of car he has or what kind of car he has access to to see if it matched the one at the train station that night. But beyond that, we don't really have a reason to think that he was involved, but it's always possible. So there is some way that it's possible that she could have been killed by somebody that she knows but I don't really know for this specific case. I honestly lean more towards it being a more random attack. I think that it's possible that she truly did just want to walk home that night. A lot of people find peace in being alone and just taking a walk to clear their head. So maybe she did that. And then as she was walking, someone stopped her and offered to give her a ride. But she said no, because again, she wanted to walk home. If she didn't want to take a taxi, she's not going to get in the car with someone she doesn't know by herself. So I think she would have said no, and then this person grabbed her as quickly as they could and shoved her into their car, hence the screaming that was heard, as well as the man's voice that was heard, and then he drove off. Again, we know about the witnesses who said that they saw someone driving like a maniac speeding down the road. Then I wonder if that person either lived near the area where she was found or if this person was just familiar with the entire area in general and just knew that this was a remote area that they could go to alone and dump her there. I really have no idea. I just think it's unbelievable how many people saw or heard something that night. 
I believe that this case could have and probably would have been solved very quickly had police just gathered these witnesses, looked more into different surveillance videos around the area, and then followed every single lead within the first week of this investigation. I think this case had such a high potential to be solved, but it wasn't because unfortunately, it seemed that police just botched it. So all I can say is that I genuinely hope that police know more than what they're saying and that the reason it seems like nothing is really happening is because they just want to keep the investigation secret. But I don't know. It's been over six years that she went missing and we still don't have answers. There has to come a time where there's been enough years that have passed that police have to realize that Maybe the public should know more. Maybe we should tell them more so that they can help us solve this because clearly keeping this investigation so secret is just not helping anything or else they would have more answers. So I guess we're just gonna have to wait and see. If you happen to know absolutely anything, please come forward with that information. I will have all of my sources listed down below as always. Make sure you either share this video or share any of the sources that I have to spread awareness about this case. I truly think that it will be solved if the right people come forward with the right information. No matter how big or small any information may seem to you, it could be exactly the missing piece that police need to solve this case. So again, if you know absolutely anything about Emily's disappearance and murder, please come forward with that information. But either way, that is all I have for today's video. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Don't forget to go ahead and click the link down below and use my code RACHELSHANNON10 for 40% off of your three native body washes. Don't forget to go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.